All CRs, may I have your attention? We need your signature for points, and Greg uh, is at the back with the clipboard, and uh, he needs your signature so you can get your points for today. I'm really happy to announce that Don Myers uh, is uh, conducting the seminar today. He's well known to all Rosarians for his articles in the American Rose Magazine. His love of plants and roses influenced his choice of career, and he holds a PhD in plant pathology from Cornell University. He is the past uh, national uh, chair of uh, Consulting Rosaria. <clears throat> He's also responsible for creating the Master Rosarian designation of the American Rosarian Award. And please, I'll remind you again, all CRs will receive one point for their attendance today. The seminar is very interesting to all of us. Pesticides, are they safe for man or beast? I'm happy to present Don Myers. Okay, thank you. I hope you've all had a good uh, lunch. This is a hard position, this timing. Why? At a Rose Convention, what's happening now? The Rose Show is opening, you wanna see your winnings and whatever, uh, or you haven't gotten back from lunch. So, nonetheless, we'll do the program, and we hope you uh, learn something from it. Uh, it is about pesticides, pesticides. It's, it's tough after I'm listening to the, all these presentations this morning of the joy of hybridizing roses. And now I'm going to talk about something that you might not find so pleasant. So <clears throat> in order to, before I tell you what I think, which I don't usually have trouble doing, uh, I have a survey. And this is what I call the pesticide survey. And it's meant to, to stir up your thinking about the subject, and where do you stand on the subject? So does, any, does everybody uh, have one that needs one? No. no, okay, I've got 100 of them, and when they're gone, they're gone. So pass them back. You don't have one? So the first word is the word pesticide. For UCRs, it's okay, she can have one. What is a pesticide? Okay, and boy, they're going like hotcakes. There, I've got it. Thank you. All right, you need another one? Yeah. All right, whatever. Sometimes people think of the word pesticide in terms of insecticide. That, yes, an insecticide is a pesticide, but all these other things are also pesticides. Fungicides, uh, miticides, herbicides, they're all pesticides. So it's, it is a more general word than many people think. And they'll say, well, I don't use pesticides. And sometimes they mean that they're not applying a, uh, an insecticide, or they're doing it very selectively. So first thing, fill out the, put the, uh, the state and climate zone where you live. Because this is important. The great state of California has some uniqueness to it compared to where I live in North Carolina. We struggle with growing roses. There's no, no, no doubt about that. If you don't spray your roses, you're gonna have issues. Even the great knockout, they're all over the place. It's like they're multiplying. To me, it's been very destructive for the rose hobby to have knockouts all over the place and not a lot of other things. But they do require less maintenance, although I could have taken a picture of one across the street that had no maintenance and had no leaves on it either. I wonder why. <coughs> so it's not perfect either. Okay, so the first question, what do you believe? And these are two or three different statements. Which one most corresponds to what you think? Rose pesticides are unnecessary toxins that kill pets, injure people, take the first one, and they harm the environment. I heard the gentleman that uh, talked this morning, Mr. Uh, Ping, 
talk about pesticides and how they harm the environment. That's his opinion. Okay? Uh, it's time to stop this pollution. The American Rose Society should endorse sustainable rose growing to grow roses without pesticides. So that should be a clear statement from the ARS. That's a, that's a view you might have. And it's okay. The second one, there is little or no evidence that pesticides used as directed kill pets, injure people, or harm the environment. Pesticides have formed the basis for growing roses for a century. New and improved pesticides have been developed with increased safety to man and the environment. I support their continued and responsible use. You might have that view. And then there's the third view, which is, I don't have enough information to understand the pesticide issue. I'm lost on this. What, are these, what, is, what is this chemical stuff? What's the problem? So you might that. So pick one. Number two, what do you believe? First one, there are plenty of roses such as earth kind selections, knockout, and other shrubs that are perfectly happy without pesticides. We don't need those finicky hybrid teas that require pesticides. And most people don't know the difference anyway, if you're talking about the, the general public. Number two, the number of sustainable roses, does everyone know what a sustainable rose knockout would be an example, uh, is very small compared to the number of roses that can be grown well in many parts of the country. We have all this excitement about sustainable roses. Now tell me, every year we get that nice little booklet, right, with roses? Have you gone through the booklet lately and, and seen how many roses there you could grow without pesticides? How many would that be? Not a lot. I would, I would be generous in saying that 80% of them can't be grown well. Now maybe in California you can get away with it, but I can tell you in North Carolina you won't. So, <clears throat> developing sustainable roses is a good objective, but we are far away from a meaningful number for our hobby. Remember, we're trying to preserve the hobby of growing roses, right? You know, when Mary, my dear wife, and I joined the American Rose Society, how many members do you think it had? 24,000. How many do you think it has today? 8,000 and change. What do the statistics say? Every year we lose about 1,000. So I'm kind of wondering, if that continues, what's going to happen to this group? It will die. It's a sad, possible truth. You know, you can't get away from the statistics. They're there. So it says we need the responsible use of pesticides to continue to grow beautiful roses. So one or two in that one. So for the third question, circle all that you agree with, not just one. You might agree with all of these. Rose show exhibitors use too many pesticides. Most of our Rose Society members don't exhibit anymore anyway. Isn't that so? The current Rose show is a dying event. We need to move on. Exhibiting roses is a thing of the past. You'll find at many rose shows, and I can tell you I was judging one, oh, th two, three weeks ago, and you know how many hybrid teas there were in the show? Zero. Zero. There were none. Now, there were plenty of very nice mini floras. You can see that trend there. And there were a number of miniatures, but zero hybrid teas. They had to scrounge to find something they could pick as a queen. And I said, oh, geez. <laughs> but the nice thing that happened was they picked it from some other class. And the woman who won the queen had never won a queen before. Probably never will again. But she was so happy. And I thought, well, this is a good thing. So it's OK. What? This was in, in uh, North Carolina, one of our local, local shows. No, I'm wrong. It was in Virginia. Take it back. So, rose show exhibitors use too many pesticides. Most of our rose society members don't exhibit anymore anyway. The current rose show is a dying event. Okay, so number two. Some exhibitors do make excessive applications in the name of perfection. Standard rose shows are declining. A few still thrive, but many members are very tired, and some societies are turning to a non-competitive exhibition. I prefer that we focus on sharing roses through non-competitive exhibitions. 
So Mary and I have written in our column about this, and there are some groups that are, are now focusing on the non-competitive part, just showing roses to share with the general public. There's not much judging involved. Some people are doing it. Third one, again, a statement about rose societies declining. There's too much information on pesticides and showing roses. No wonder we can't attract new members. You come to a rose meeting, what happens? They're talking about intimate statements about pesticides, and, and it doesn't really, it's just so very complicated. How many do you need to grow a rose bush? And that turns some people off. You can grow beautiful roses without pesticides, and that is what we need to promote. That's number three. And number four, we talked about this, the data support the decline of the American Rose Society and the local Rose Society. Excessive pesticide and exhibition information may contribute, but the real causes of decline are the changing needs of our population. There's too little time for clubs. The internet tells us everything, doesn't it? You, go, you can Google it, and it'll tell you exactly what to do. Why do you need a Rose Society? I tell a story, uh, I've told this story before, where I was asked to give a talk at a, um, it was a North Jersey Rose Society. And it was a Saturday, they had it at a country club, and it was very nice, you know, they had a lovely lunch, and I went there and I, I was gonna talk, and I said to them, well, <clears throat> um, when is your rose show? <sighs> we don't do rose shows anymore, okay? There are about 30 of them. And then I said, okay, that's fine. Then this question number two was, what roses do you grow? Oh, we don't grow roses anymore. <laughs> and uh, we're too old. And I thought that was very interesting, very revealing of the, of the way things are going. So what had happened? This particular society had become a social club. People liked each other. They like coming for the food. Don't you like, you know, food is always an attraction. <laughs> you know, sometimes the biggest, uh, the biggest number of people you have at a meeting is the annual, the holiday party, let's say. Yeah. When people bring all those dishes to pass that mother used to make, and you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so, think about that as well. Okay, so what is the future of pesticide use on roses, and what do you think about this? First scenario, Things will continue much as they are. Some people remain users of pesticides, it's like they're addicts. Others will go organic or manage without spraying anything. That's number one. You can only answer, uh, one answer is appropriate here. Scenario two, the US will follow the path of Canada. EPA will ban the use of pesticides in many parts of the country for amenity uses. The word amenity means turf and ornamentals, basically, including roses. In fact, these kinds of things are already happening, to some extent, in some places. In fact, there are, there are a lot of strict rules now about using pesticides in school schoolyards, that where children might be exposed to them. So things like this are happening. All right, and it concludes by saying the CR, let's see, no, that's the third one. Uh, ARS should endorse a policy of sustainable rose growing and recommend growing locally sustainable roses without pesticides. The CR handbook should be revised to recommend roses that can be grown without pesticides. Well, it'll be a very short one, won't it? But that, anyway, that's the third one. So pick one of those. And what are the consequences of a pesticide-free rose hobby? So let's say we go in that direction. Number one, and circle all that apply. The majority of modern roses cannot be grown successfully in many parts of the country without pesticides. Number two, the list of recommended roses would be reduced by at least 80% because many of these roses cannot be grown without pesticides. Go in the, the room there, wherever it is, the rose show, and think about this question. Support to ARS from basic manufacturers who sell pesticides would end, and it sure would. I work for Bayer, the German company, or Bayer, as they say in Germany. And do you think they're going to support the American Rose Society if you reject, fully reject the use of pesticides? Eh, I don't think so. On the other hand, <clears throat> things are happening. Uh, Bayer has just purchased a company called AgriQuest, which is located in, in Davis, California. And <clears throat> AgriQuest is uh, involved in the creation of biological type pesticides you might think of them as safer for the environment. So Bayer is very interested in this subject. 
Now, why is Bayer interested? Because they love humanity? Well, I hope they do. But you know, what does drive the big corporations? Money. Do people drive them? Yes, people are much involved, but they can become expendable if, if the money is not being made. So it's a very, you have to support the shareholders. Our friend Mr. Romney was talking about, I have left this about, uh, I won't get too political, but he was talking about uh, uh, corporations, their people too. I said, well, yeah, sort of. Okay. Uh, the traditional rose show would end, or the rules would have to change dramatically to allow injured roses, those with black spot mildew, insect damage, grown without pesticides. Well, I'll tell you, I brought some today and was using my deckel scissors to cut off as much black spot as I could, because there, there was some. The Rose Expo would continue, but with fewer entries and reduced participation. Uh, Mary and I call the Rose Expo the, the exposition of roses, the non-judge type exhibition. Now, we have had some emails from people who have denounced this, saying, well, we, we should support the Rose Society, or the Rose Show. And I said, well, I still love the Rose Show. But the Rose Show is changing, whether we like it or not. OK, the traditional exhibitor who uses pesticide would leave ARS, resulting in a further decline of membership. Whether you like them or not, exhibitors form a very active minority of ARS and local society membership. The energy they would bring would be then lost. So there's some thoughts there for you to, to consider. Hope you will fill this out. And I'd like you to return them to me so I can tabulate and share them at a future date. Do you have any thoughts on this subject? Yes, sir. government has banned all use of pesticides for cosmetic reasons. I know. And the, the, um, the gardening business is, a, is, a, is in a real mess. The only plants that seem to be doing well are dandelions. <laughs> I'm involved with the head of the research committee, and what we do is evaluate proposals that come into us, or even solicit them, about problems or issues that are important to the American Rose Society. I'll give you an example. We funded a grant from the University of Tennessee on Rose Rosette. Now, Rose Rosette is an interesting situation where uh, it, was, it was started to be spread for, for good reason. Because of the weed, the Rosa multiflora, uh, there were researchers at uh, Iowa State University that thought it would be a good idea to spread this. Well, they didn't know what it was at the time. It turned out to be a virus. Spread this virus, and it would kill the Rosa multiflora. This was a good example of biological control. But often what happens with biocontrol, it's not thought about well enough. And so indeed what happened, there were not only is the Rosa multiflora affected, but modern roses are also being killed. And the disease in the last 30, 40 years has spread all across the country. I even found one in my own garden. I denied it for a few days. <clears throat> then I decided, well, I better not deny it anymore. Basically, you don't have too many choices with that. You have to really take it out of the ground. 
particularly if it shows the symptoms. Uh, you can see these witch's broom symptoms. Anyway, <clears throat> the ARS is sponsoring a, this, this work, and the test plant, you'll be amused, is none other than our friend Knockout. Knockout is highly sensitive to the rose rosette disease. So ARS does good things, and this is one of the good things that it does. So uh, we, have a, uh, we have money that we can spend uh, up to a point, and uh, uh, we'll continue to do this in the years ahead. So that's what's going on. Any other comments on pesticides, ma'am? Yes. So far, the EPA uh, has not done that. Uh, the chemical industry is among the most highly regulated industries. You wouldn't believe what we go through. And when people say, we, have, we need to get rid of regulation, we need to be free, I said, well, goodness, this is not an area that freedom would be good. Regulation here is very, very important. And to, to develop a new compound, how much do you think, how much does anybody think that it cost Bayer or any of the basic manufacturers to bring a new pesticide to the marketplace? What it? 200, the current cost is 200 and roughly 260 million. So with that in mind, <clears throat> only so many people can do this. And Bayer, yes, has got money. They can, the Germans are good at, spend, at saving their money, and they have a lot to spend. It's OK. Uh, but do you think we're going to be spending it for roses in particular? No, not at all. Roses are a very secondary thought. You know, the food crop is what's important. And that's really the basis of, of what I wanted to talk about in terms of pesticide safety. It's a very important issue for you to think about because uh, a lot of statements made about pesticides that I think need to be challenged. The, the basic manufacturers of pesticides have been relatively complacent about challenging statements that are made. And it's time to challenge some of this because some of them are just wrong. Yes, sir. People have to eat, don't you? How do you think you would eat without pesticides? Are you being poisoned? Do you think you're going to be, you know, I've been spraying pesticides now for 50 years. I'm still here. So that's one example I've survived it. Go ahead. OK, just to clarify that question, um, golf courses and farms and the horticultural, commercial horticultural business looking after lawns have some, have some uh, use available to them. Not much for the lawns, but for the golf courses and the farming industry, there basically has been no change. Yes. 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 Golf courses, you still use pesticides. <laughs> yes, ma'am. But do you know, also, because I don't spray anymore because I can't stand the smell, um, and I've noticed I have more bugs that take care of the nasty ones. You think so? Okay. I think so. Right. And I have birds that come in. Okay. All right. But pests, I don't think Do you grow roses? Yes. How are they? They look fine until I move. <laughs> <laughs> well, what were you, how were you taking care of your roses? Um, fertilizing, water, spraying things. them, washing them. And occasionally, if I got a scale or something, I'd use some soap, dishwashing soap. That's, is that considered a pesticide? Or you love it? Yeah. Oh, is, is, is soap a pesticide? Is it? Is it I guess so. <laughs> In the way she's using it, it would be considered a pesticide. But only a little. <laughs>
Yes, ma'am. Yes. yes. That's all you use. Do you have roses? I have tons of roses, but I strip every single rose and clean up all the stuff. And I what do you mean you strip them? Take all the leaves off? I take every leaf off and I spray it. Everything is broke three times, and I don't have any trouble. I get a few agents, maybe. That's it. And where do you live? Davis. Oh, Davis, no wonder. <laughs> So maybe it is for most of you here, but the reality is, in the humid parts of the U.S., we have we have issues that are very serious in terms of, let's say, black spot. And this year was a horrendous year in North Carolina. I, there was a, there was a new disease in my garden. I've never seen this before. The entire bushes would just die back completely and turn black. This die right to the ground, dead. I lost maybe 25 or so. What that is, I don't know at this point. But I, I was philosophical about it and said, well, basically, it gives me a place for a new bush. But, uh, okay. I doubt it. I mean, I, I, I suspect they did, but who knows? I mean, uh, I have never seen this before. And you live where? Probably North Carolina, Wake Forest, North Carolina. Yes. Huh? John Magnesco was talking Same to us thing. about losing about 100 with, with the, uh, the, 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 the things fell over and then died, died flat down to the ground. Okay. So the pests, the pests are ahead of us. They're there and they keep coming. It's, uh, we have to be aware of them. Black spot is the most serious. What do you think in California is your most serious pest? Gulfers. What is it? <laughs> Thank you. 
people do you think we're going to have to feed in, in the year 2015? Uh, All of them. <laughs> Because they said, well, it's synthetic, it's not natural, it must be more dangerous. A lot of, I've heard that comment a lot. You don't trust science. A lot, most people, they don't. Or industry. We talked about that before. Industry wants to make money. So are you trusting industry to do the right thing? There is certainly a mythical image of organic farming. It must be good because it's organic. Look at that closely. Uh, poor understanding of risk versus hazard to the environment. We can talk a little about that. Sensational media reports. The media will get something and they'll, they'll blow it out, all out of proportion. How many people do you think an American farmer feeds? In the year 1900, every farmer fed seven people. Now, in today, we're at 155. So the whole farming operation has become far more efficient than it ever. We're doing it on less land, with less input, and we're feeding more people. And fewer farmers. And with fewer farmers. Those trends have to continue if we're to be successful in feeding a world of 9.2 billion. So what are your perceptions about the pesticides and bio biotechnology? Some people think, well, it's unnecessary. We don't need these things. It's poorly regulated and not tested. I'll tell you that's false. They cause cancer. They must. And other illnesses. They harm the environment. They're not sustainable for the future. And we're creating frankenfoods. Isn't there a big thing in California about labeling products that have uh, biotech uh, genes in them? Yeah, so you vote for that. What do you think that's going to get you? Are you, are you not going to eat that food? You'll be surprised how much of how many foods have it in there. It's tremendous amount because it's corn. Corn is the basis for many foods. Okay. And then there are there are other the other side of the argument that organic methods are pesticide free. You think that's true? No, it's not. <laughs> that organic foods are more nutritious, more healthy, false. That's not true either. They're safer, safer to people in the environment, perhaps. They perform better and are more sustainable. I don't think so. So are pesticides really then necessary? You realize that we don't spray a lot of crops. I have a picture here in this presentation of some cucumbers. And on the left, the spray, and you can see what happened on the right, loaded with the disease. So we need to spray our, our uh, plants to keep them healthy. So let's talk a little about pesticide safety. You realize that, again, to register a product, a new pesticide, there are at least 120 studies that are necessary for health, safety, and the environment. This is the kind of work that I do. I'm involved in this work with Bayer. We've registered a new herbicide that they, they really, the EPA really liked. A huge number of studies. The money is there. I told you about the money. And the pesticide must perform its intended function without unreasonable adverse effects to the environment. If it doesn't, EPA will, will, will reject it. And California is also unique. California is one of the few states that actually requires that when we want to register a pesticide in the state, that we provide data, efficacy data, that shows that it works. You realize most other states don't do that. 
They just believe us. And so, <laughs> California requires the data. So that's another thing about pesticides. Well, if it's good enough to use California, it's probably good enough for all the rest of them, too, I think. Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about do, do uh, UCRs know what the LD50 is? You should. What is the L? What is it? The LD50. Sorry. Okay. So lethal dose for 50% of those treatments. Okay. So what do you think the lethal dose is for paraffin? That's an old insecticide. It's very, very low. Ten. 10 milligrams per kilogram. You don't, a milligram is a very small amount related to a kilogram, so you don't need much. On the other hand, what do you think the LD50 is for vitamin D? Do any of you take vitamin D? It's very popular now to do that. Well, 10, the same as paraffin. Now, there are other materials that are safer, how about nicotine? Where do you think that falls? 55. So it's getting higher. Um, caffeine. What about caffeine? It is 200. But it's 20 to 50 times more toxic than many pesticides. And you get enough toxicity with, with uh, drinking. You drank 16 cups of coffee a day you would be taking in a tremendous amount of rat poisoning. <laughs> so I would recommend not drinking 16 cups a day. <laughs> Where do you think aspirin is? 750 for aspirin. Uh, salt, 2,500. Pyrethrum, which is a natural insecticide, 200 to 2,600, depending on the type that it is. And glyphosate, what's glyphosate? You know what glyphosate is? Round up. 4320 for glyphosate. So at the end of the day, the dose makes the poison. So you have to be aware of that as a CR, this, this type of stuff. Again, the low number is the bad number. Thank you. The low number is the bad number. Well, sure it is. But how much you're taking in is also a factor. Do your local societies, do your CRs, actually talk about these kinds of issues once in a while? Yes. yes. I know it's kind of dry, but it's a, it's a good thing to do, don't you think? Yes. Okay. All pesticides have legal limit residues that, that are permitted by the EPA. So the amount that can be on your food is strongly regulated by EPA. And occasionally there are issues when a certain amount is tested on a particular crop and you get more than, than the legal limit. And you have a lot of uh, newspaper headlines. Many of these can be very sensational. The thing, interesting thing is that all of the synthetic chemicals are tested, but the natural ones generally are not. And a lot of these materials, these natural <coughs> are very strong toxins. So just because it's natural, that doesn't mean it's going to be safe. It just disappears faster, right? What? It just degrades faster, right? Where are you? Oh. What? Who said this? <laughs> <laughs> the, the natural ones degrade faster, correct? Not necessarily. Really? I mean, the natural might mean that there's something in the environment that does degrade them, but I'll tell you this, for all the pesticides that are, that are committed, there are microorganisms or they're naturally degraded. So the sun is a good agent for degrading pesticides. The length of time a pesticide can stay in the soil is very limited. It's not like the old days when they could stay forever and ever. Do you know what they used? Uh, there, read some of the books, the old Rose books. Yeah. And there's some things, I, I read this one, and she was, I can't think of her name, she came from Cornell too. A uh, very famous uh, Rose, Rose Doctor. Well, what were they using, who is it? Cynthia Westcott. Yeah, exactly, Cynthia Westcott. Well, what was Cynthia using? Cadmium, I thought, that's a good one. That's a good one. Cadmium, they were using at the time for disease control. You realize overall cancer deaths, excluding lung cancer, have declined 
cents since 1950, so it's on the decline. Risk of cancer from eating trace residues is a thousand times less than eating carcinogens found in beer, wine, and cola. So the amount of residue from these pesticides is so low, you would have to put away a lot of it in order to have an issue. Reducing synthetic pesticides will reduce dietary cancers. That's not true. Trace levels are permitted. And frankly, the pesticides help ensure cancer-fighting fruit and vegetables remain plentiful. Remember why you're eating these vegetables that you don't like, the broccoli and all that. They help to prevent the cancer that you're going to die from. So having a little residue on them, such, is that such a bad thing? No. Now, I think we talked about this. Yes, this question. Is an organic food more nutritious? No. no. There are numerous studies on this point. Cereals, potatoes, vegetables, fruits, nuts, oils, bread, milk, and dietary. There are no clear differences between food that is organically grown and food, food that is grown with pesticides. So I've had some interesting situations going to the food store. And I'll say to my mom, I don't want to spend more on that organic stuff. I want pesticide treats. <laughs> it's less, it's cheaper too. So I've stirred them up a couple times in the food store. Some of the stuff in organic food can be quite toxic. So think about all these things. And don't just take what I'm saying or what any make your own decision about these things. You will anyway. So think about it. Are there are a lot of bacteria. Some of these bacteria on food, you get, you hear these different things that occur, uh, bacteria that are found in melons and different things. It happens every year. We have people that are uh, poisoned by these things. So keeping down the level of these organic attackers is a, is a good thing. How do you think organic growers grow plants? Do they use herbicides? What is, what is a herbicide? A weed killer. So how do they control weeds? Hand pulling. That's the way it's done. Hand pulling. In fact, there was some law in California that had to be overturned back in 2004. Organic producers asked and received an exemption from the ban against hand weeding in California. Another thing that's a misperception about organic stuff, a lot of people think, well, it comes from the small local producers. You think that's true? No, it's not true. Does it matter? Some comes from China, I'm sure. Everything else does. <laughs> Big corporations, you know, they're evil, so it's coming from them as well. They're, they're selling it, often imported from other countries. So this, just because it's organic, that doesn't mean you have some little, nice little person uh, producing this organic food with love. No. no. U.S. food companies import 50% of organic soybeans from China. Good old China. Let's see what we have. We're almost at the end of this part. So, do you think organic food is sustainable? Some claim so, but the logic says otherwise. Not really. It's going to be very difficult to sustain the populations we have with just organic food. You can choose to eat it, if you can afford it, but for the general population, we're going to need a way to produce food in higher quantities. Right now, pesticides are the answer to that. Also, the biotechnology that's coming in, the genes that have been inserted into plants to control insects. Do you think it's possible, for example, to insert genes into rose bushes to control black spot? I don't know why it wouldn't be. I think it's a good idea. And here's another statement. Uh, to produce food for today with technology of 1960, we would have to double the area of cultivation. That's not going to happen either. 
itself. Let me bring the conversation then back to roses. I think I hopefully I've given you some food for thought about this subject. Is it organic? What? The food for thought. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make your personal decision to use pesticides based on facts, not strictly emotion, or statements that are unproven. Consider the implications for our rose hobby. How are we going to be growing roses in the years ahead? Do we have a sustainable rose hobby? You know, unfortunately, you know, the, one of the sad things about the rose hobby to me is like every month or so, there'll be an email that says, sad news. Sad news. And what is that email? Well, it's the obvious. So-and-so has passed away. You know, and sometimes, well, you didn't know the person real, but other times it really hits home. Somebody you really knew very well and you're very sad about. And unfortunately, look at this room, other than the dye hair. You, know, you, have, you have a lot of hair this color. I do call this, I, I've named this color for my wife. I call it Ashes of Blonde. It's quite natural. She likes it. But I will say this use common sense when you're using pesticides. Limit your own exposure. Just because I say something, you can believe it or not. But do you want to expose yourself to a toxicant? No. So what does one do about that? CR should know this subject very well. Do you spray every week? Do you need to spray every week? No. No. Do you need to spray with an insecticide every week? No. 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 Only put it on when you need it. Another thing I've been willing to do for a long time is to tolerate a certain amount of, of disease in the yard. So what if there's some? The world won't end. I still can grow roses. And yes, ma'am, you want to say? Sometimes the problem is convincing the public that they don't have to spray or move. And that's where the problem lies. And for us going to Lowe's or Home Depot in California and watching people who don't understand about growing roses or plants in general. They've got their hands clenched around that box or whatever. And they're going, oh, well, look, it says this, but we'll go home and do that. And I can't even tell you how many times I've heard that. Well, there's, there's what I call in Lowe's, Lowe's Home Depot, the big box stores. Yeah. I call it the wall of pesticides. Yeah. And, of and, it is. and I've gone in there a few times, just stand, stood there, just to see what happens. And people are looking glazed. What should I buy? Of course, I can tell them what they should buy. But, uh, <laughs> and there has a whole program they call the Weekend Warriors. Uh, these are employees that go out to the big box stores and actually work in the stores to give advice to people that are buying these chemicals. So, yes? Yeah, to follow up on just what you were saying, I think a lot of the problems is when like, a novice goes into a store you know, to get some kind of relief from whatever disease or pest they have, they often ask the clerk if it's completely untrained. So it depends on what store they go to. We have one store that actually hires a couple master gardeners for Giant One. And they make sure that the information they give is quite appropriate and they direct them appropriately. And the way they stock their shelves is all at the most low toxicity ones are right about level, and the higher ones that are not that high actually are on the very top level. So it really depends on what the store is trying to do. And if they're trying to drive sales and money and flood the market with a lot of junk that isn't necessary. That's what happens at you know, some of the box stores. I don't think it happens at your very fine nursery. So that's where I see the issue of success. Okay, thank you. Other comments on the subject? About limiting your exposure. Yes, sir. I, I, I have a question about uh, uh, the, the different manufacturers themselves. Do they feel like it's necessary to develop similar but new products to take an old product off the market? Okay. On this subject, uh, do they do do chemical companies feel they need to develop new products that are similar to old ones? One of the issues that's occurred since about 1960, the number of high quality chemicals has increased greatly. So now there are very few problems for which there is not a chemical solution. 
So it's, you're always trying to raise the bar. Well, if you've got 95% control of something, is 98% going to be of any value? You won't be able to see it. So that's, that consideration is there. We're moving in different directions. The sustainable thing is very important. Bayer has developed what they call the biologics group, and they're, use, they're working solely on these biological type controls, because they know the future of synthetic pesticides, I'll say it's, it's going to, it will continue most likely, but we need other solutions as well. So, for example, an old chemical, I don't know if anyone used it, I was talking to Patsy about this, uh, Sentinel, did anyone ever use Sentinel? Well, it's coming back. Now, for roses, I don't know about, but I know that Syngenta, which is the uh, purveyor now of that, uh, is bringing it back. And if, for black spot, it was the only thing that I thought 21 to 28 days it would work. The negative part about it is very easy for people to become overly exuberant and overdose. And when you overdose, you would get a shortening of the inner nodes, so the plants would be short. Not good overall. Certainly, you're growing exhibition roses. It wasn't good. So things are yes. My major issue with pesticides has been that they tend to destroy the predator insects as well as the, the insects you want to destroy. So, have there been any movement towards chemicals that can differentiate? Oh, definitely. That's part of the studies that go on now. It's not a simple matter, though. No, I'm not sure. And I'll, I'll be the big one, the big one, is the bumblebee. That's a big one. And uh, Bayer, Bayer has a strong commitment to looking at how their materials affect bumblebees. There was this whole thing about colony collapse. You've heard about it in the news right. on 60 Minutes everywhere. And they want to blame pesticides for that. <clears throat> the evidence is really quite mixed that pesticides are really involved in it. It was probably this varroa mite that was the no major cause, but there's a lot of questions. So Bayer is spending some millions of dollars on a new bee center where they're looking at better, better understanding how, how these materials affect bees and colonies and that. So there's a lot of interest there. Go ahead. <clears throat> As um, rosarians and consulting rosarians, uh, we're supposed to be sort of in the knowledge. We can't put the blame totally on these chemical uh, companies because our expectations are so high that we want one product that takes care of everything, no matter what, when nature itself should be the perfection. We think we can improve on that by putting a whole bunch of chemicals out there uh, when we, our tolerance of perfection should become lower. Because black spot has its uh, uh, enemies of uh, uh, pesticides, the, the uh, pests that are going, the aphids, uh, worms, whatever, they have their enemies. We don't want them, and that's why we're putting all these chemicals on. But what are we doing to the environment by doing that? Let's give nature a chance, and not, not just blame it on the chemical companies. They're only giving us what we're asking for. That's true. Mm -hmm. OK. Yes, sir. There's much research being done on natural immune uh, things, like messenger carbon. Uh, things of that nature. Yes, yes, there's been a lot on that. It probably will continue. Uh, from the research I saw, in a practical sense, a lot of those things didn't work so well. You couldn't prove it scientifically that they were they were working well. Um, it's like controlling Japanese beetles with the, uh, the bacteria in the soil. Science says it doesn't work, but people believe it. And I said, look, you believe it, go ahead and use it. It's fine if you think it works. The science, though, doesn't support that. But, yes, answer your point. Go ahead. The other, the other day on NPR, that's the court station, um, they were talking about uh, uh, DDT and how we pass and uh, Monsanto said how safe it was. So can we always trust these big companies to tell us the truth? <laughs> well, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm a person, a rose person, 
and I will look at it myself and make my own decision about what the company says. They say something that I don't believe in, I'll say so. It's at the end of people that have but, to say. But you have some knowledge, little person that's just going to the grocery store or the box store, they don't... Well, they make no mistake, the companies want to make money. Right. I, there's no doubt about that. 100% for sure, certain of it. We don't supply without providing money to the shareholders. So it's true. There's some truth to that. So the point is, that I'll leave you with this kind of statement. Limit your exposure. Do practical things that reduce the frequency of applications, as well as exposure to yourself, to your pets. Oh, there are stories about pets, which I won't go into. But I know this. We have two spoiled toy poodles. And I could tell you, if anything happened to them, because I was spraying something on the roses, there would be hell to pay. <laughs> so, but nothing has happened to them. So, literature exposure, that's all. Yeah. I live in a community that's economic base. It's growing peanuts and cotton. And you talk about chemicals. Yes, those are very heavy users. They grow chemicals. Now, our, all our consulting Rosarians are from the agricultural community. The first Rose meeting I ever went to was a seminar, and this one woman pulled out this Tyvek suit that she wears out of a bag. She never washed it or hosed it off. We were in an enclosed room. Um, I had to leave. I had to leave. But that's the mentality. Well, I thought, I'm not going to do this. And I went to Wolves, and was familiar with the name Bear. So I started reading, and I got my product, and I used my product, and I thought, these people now who are living in the city have got to find a better way. I have called Bear on that 800 number from Silver Line. I've talked to people in North Carolina. I've talked to people in Connecticut. Was where Connecticut? Didn't sound right though. Yeah. Um, but I have talked to people, I have emailed. I have never gotten a single call back or response. And we can warriors can never come to our level. <laughs> well, we have them. I mean, I don't know the full extent of them, but I know we have them in our area. Of course, that's where the main office is, so. Right. Good reason. I would love to have weekend warriors. And I can go up to the manager, the main manager at Lowe's, if we have to, if we can get but keep in mind, as Rose said, well said, it is also the responsibility of the CRs to, to manage this issue. It's not only a chemical company problem. We as Rosarians have to take ownership of it and manage it the best we can. And I think I've reached the end of my time. Thank you for listening and participating. I would like to get the questionnaires back.